Hi, welcome to SignalPad. I have another repair video for you guys. I know this is one of your favorite things, so I bought a couple of broken equipment from eBay uh, across a few different categories. Uh, so let's start with a, uh, hopefully a simple one. Uh, this is a, a Hewlett Packard or an Agilin E3631A triple output power supply. This thing can go from 0 to 6 volts on one of these outputs up to 5 amps, and it can do plus or minus 25 volts up to 1 amp from another uh, set of outputs. It has two isolated grounds. Uh, which are separate the 6 volt and plus or minus 25 volt are completely isolated from one another and the common is shared between the plus and minus 25. It can do tracking uh, between the plus and minus volts and you know it has GPIB interface, it has serial interface and you've seen me use these type of power supplies all around the lab. I have actually another one of these in my lab. I don't remember repairing one of these on video before uh, but I have repaired a different type of uh, power supply on video before. So anyhow, <clears throat> I'm sure it's going to be very interesting to take a look and see what's wrong with it. I've already plugged it in. Let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. There we go, and then nothing. It just shows that display briefly. There you go. Oh, this time it was actually much faster. Interesting. Let's try again. Yep, and it gives you a little beep, and it goes away, and then nothing shows up. Uh, I tried to look at the GPIB port on it directly under the computer to see if the, if the problem was with the display, and uh, it doesn't respond to the GPIB neither. So. It has some other internal problem, but it obviously does some things because I can hear the fan come on and the display obviously powers on momentarily. So uh, I think we're going to have to open it up and uh, take a look and see what's going on inside and see if we can fix it. One of the nice things is that the schematic for this is actually available, which is going to be a huge, huge help if the problem is difficult to locate. So I'm excited to take a look. Let's go. Here's the first stage of the disassembly. You can see that it's, the unit is actually almost completely covered up. There's an opening here uh, for the air intake and there's one on the other side here. So here's the back of the unit. You can see that I've taken the, the case off and this was a nice unit to get because it had all the rubber feet and everything including the handlebar on the side. Now if you look closely you can see that there is a, a hinge here so obviously this is going to open this way and there's going to be um, two halves of it so it's clearly made to be serviced. That's why they've gone through putting the mechanical structure required to have this open like, you know, like a door kind of and uh, there should be circuitry on both of these so I have to take a few more screws off here and then we can open it and then we should be able to have a very nice clear view on the inside alright here we go we should be able to open this now it should slide over let me see it's kind of stuck I guess ah there we go there it is wow look at that let me see if this goes far enough I'm going to have to move the camera back a bit. There we go. Put something underneath it here so it doesn't stand up. I'm going to give you a better look at this. Right now you can only see, I guess, only part of it uh, because of the, the fact that it's a, it's a long structure so it's difficult to fit it into the frame. But you can get a, an idea of how this is obviously put together. Interesting, they've put the transformer all the way here in the front just behind the LCD screen. It's the front of the instrument, of course. And you can see all the, the cabling coming from the mains uh, all tied together. This has a a real line uh, switch there so when you disconnect it, it disconnects it from the power and you can see all the different uh, cabling go in. There's some big filtering capacitors there obviously heatsink here and heatsink here so there is uh, clearly two different sections that they anticipate to have high power through them. This has triple output so perhaps the, the two outputs are handled with uh, two different boards. I suspect this is the Given the fact that we've got two, two separate heat sinks here, perhaps this is a plus or minus 25 volt output and this is a 6 volt output. I have to double check. This is just uh, based on what I'm looking at over here. You can see some shunt resistors for measuring current. There's two of them in here and there's two actually in there which are just uh, beyond your uh, view there. And this cable here which has come off the body uh, is a, just the cable that drives the LCD. This cable here connects this top board to the bottom board perhaps for digital communication and I.O. and so on because the GPIB connectors and everything are at the back here even though the processor is clearly up here the, the firmware ROM is obviously here uh, so the, the, most of the digital processing is handled here this board is much more bare has fewer components on it than this one in terms of surface mount components and digital components and so on there is some ICs there that handle the uh, GPIB and serial communication fan over here clearly blows air from and blows through air from here and here so the heat sinks are designed to kind of be on, flip on top of each other and the heat uh, to give the optimum airflow from the fan to the heat sinks so it's a nice design you can see that the big air capacitors are all tied down tied together looks good lots of protection circuits here uh, there's these are different cables coming from the 
a transformer. And actually, you know what? Now that I'm looking at it, yeah, you know what? I was right about that uh, initial assessment. This is the actual plus or minus 25 volt output. So you can see this is coming from this board. So this is definitely the plus or minus 25, and this is the 6 volt output because the 6 volt uh, going to the front comes from this board, it seems. These are transformers. It's a little bit interesting that the transformer cables coming out, uh, which are obviously AC, are tied with a uh, twist tie onto. Uh, this cable, which is a plus or minus 25, I wonder if there is any coupling. They have a common mode, a ferrite here. Uh, but nonetheless, interesting that they have to go ahead and done that. Perhaps it doesn't make much of a difference in their case. Um, it's nice. It looks really, really complicated uh, for a plus or minus 25 and a you know, 6 volt power supply. But, you know, this is what uh, Keysight Agent has been doing. This is still something they sell. This is quite expensive, over $1,000 each so you know being able to repair these for a fraction of that cost is definitely going to be a good thing I have another one of these in my lab I was just checking around so if you're completely stuck and we are still unable to figure out what's going on given that we have the schematic we still have a reference one we can always take apart and take a look and change boards around if you really get desperate but other than that looks good so now that it's open like this we can go ahead and uh, turn it on and see um, what happens just so that we can maybe probe a couple of voltages there because I can see the transformer cables coming here you know I can see th thicker traces around this area where the, uh, the power is being uh, driven to this port so we can at least get some quick measurements that way well I'm gonna go power it back on there we go I can see the fan is running you hear the beep again and uh, you know I was just as I opened it as I was uh, looking around it does smell a little bit uh, strange actually uh, these heat sinks are, are very very cool but something in there smells a uh, little bit burnt I'm not sure what's going on I, I don't see any smoke coming off of anything but uh, you know touching the this is the uh, oh, this is fairly cold this is the processor this is fine yeah these are all all cold and here ah you son of a freaking freaking well I apologize for that this component here is burning hot wow that was a uh, that's got to be over a hundred degrees Celsius guys it burned the tip of my finger well at least I have the wine that's gonna help out well there's a here's our first clue this certainly shouldn't be burning uh, this temperature so for the heck of it and I haven't <laughs> I was gonna do some measurements on it but hey if this is burning at this temperature it's, it's got to be something wrong there so let's get the thermal camera out and let's take a look at this board all right here we go I'm gonna try and hold everything steady. I'm doing many, many things at the same time, so I apologize if this is shaking. So here's our heat sink. You can see I've put the the thermal camera in MSX mode, so there's a blending of uh, visual and infrared information, and you can see the outline of the heat sink. I've tried to uh, focus this uh, as well as I can so that uh, we can see it. I've also set the camera to a uh, high temperature range so you can measure all the way up to 650 degrees Celsius because I suspect that those components are getting much hotter than. 100 degrees Celsius by the, the how hot they felt when I first touched it. So let's go ahead and power this on and see what we see. Here we go. Ooh, look at that. There we go. Oh my god. 360 degrees Celsius. You have got, oh my god, you gotta be kidding me. So this is actually above, now that the solder surely is molten. Uh, at the junction but this temperature is not sustainable it has to come down at some point because it's I, I don't understand how this is surviving at this temperature uh, anyhow so there's two things that are heating up so here's our, um, our regulator the IC wow 400 here's the IC there that you can clearly see that it's causing there you go see the temperatures dropping there you go I, I knew it wasn't sustainable so something is kicked in and uh, is now going backwards all right, so the temperature of the, if I block my, just block the, the heat from one finger, you can see that the heat sink is sitting at 160 degrees Celsius. There's another component sitting now at 270. You went all the way up to 400 at the beginning. And this looks to me like a diode. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at what this component and this component are in the schematic. And at the same time, I can go ahead and look at a couple of other things on the board. But uh, these are basically the, the components that are just incredibly, incredibly hot. So there's something going on. Uh, and this is a this is a good starting point for us to start to take a look and and figure it out from the schematic. So here's a Zener diode, uh, I believe that's getting really really hot, and here is a voltage regulator that's getting really really hot. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the schematic. There's another component that I want to show you that I'm measuring right now, and you can see its temperature is steadily dropping. And I wonder if this is one of the reasons why 
uh, the whole thing uh, is, is slows down after some time and cools down a little bit and um, I'm going to talk about this so you can see right now it's sitting at 400 degrees Celsius so if I go ahead and remove the camera and we can focus onto the component and I can show you what that is there we go now you may immediately recognize that if you've seen this before I'm not sure if I've talked about these components before in my other videos let me increase the light a little bit so these are um, uh, resistor fuses not to be mistaken with obviously regular fuses and not to be mistaken with thermistors or thermal fuses these are totally different components all of these are different from one another so a, a resistor fuse is a, a, a fuse essentially which reacts to power so unlike a regular fuse which blows once the current through it exceeds a certain amount let me turn this off not to stress this anymore a resistor fuse will eventually blow once a certain amount of power dissipation is reached over a certain duration of time. So resistor fuses are rated, for example, you can say, okay, if the power dissipated through this resistor is at uh, 20 watts over a certain duration, then it should blow. So you can kind of get an idea of when these would be used because they, they act like regular resistors when they're operating in normal conditions. And if their power dissipation exceeds a certain amount over a certain duration of time, then they will blow like a regular fuse. A thermal fuse reacts to temperature, a regular fuse reacts to current, a resistor fuse reacts to power, and a thermistor, yet a completely different component, reacts resistance changes as a function of temperature. So those are very, very different things. And I'm surprised that these haven't blown, but it could be that uh, this is one of the reasons why we see the temperature drop. Perhaps it's just partially failing as the temperature increases and, uh, and then the resistance drops, and when the resistance goes up at, at some point, and once the resistance goes up, then then the current drops and so on. Maybe it's a partially blown fuse, I'm not sure, but we can measure it and find out. Nonetheless, this is one of the other components that gets really hot, so, which means that all of these guys must be in some way related. And, you know, it kind of makes sense. This is uh, coming from one of the transformers. This is a two AC currents going through here, and I can see it going through these parallel capacitors, and there's a rectifier here, and the rectifier feeds these two filtering capacitors, and these are all in close proximity of these components right here, the voltage regulator and the zener diode, so I'm not surprised that they are all connected. So we have now a clear path of investigation, which is great. So we can look at the schematic and figure it out. So here's the part of the schematic that is most likely giving us trouble. At least initially, this is a good place to start. Here, this, if you notice that this is the bias supply for plus and minus 25 power circuit, front panel and floating logic. So this makes sense why our front panel doesn't work anymore is because if this portion obviously has problems, it's likely that the front panel isn't getting the, the correct supply or it could be that uh, some uh, digital circuitry because the floating logic is in here is preventing the display from being properly communicated with. So that kind of makes sense. Here I've put three red dots here, over here, here and here, and these are the three components on the thermal camera that we just were looking at that were heating up to crazy, crazy temperatures. Initially, you can start uh, from the fuse one, fuse two, these are the resistors, um, the fuse resistors here, and this is fed from directly a coil of the transformer. So we have a secondary uh, transformer coil, and this is a common in the middle. And if you follow the circuit going forward, we have the differential um, signal or the, uh, the AC signal coming out here, going into our full bridge rectifier, and the full bridge rectifier generates our uh, plus and minus uh, voltages here, which are isolated, of course, because it's an isolated port of the transformer, and they're filtered by these filter caps, and they go through two voltage regulators, one positive and one negative. And if you follow the positive and negative voltages, you can see that that's how the uh, minus 16.4 volt and plus 16.4 volt voltages are generated. The plus and minus 15 volts are generated from the plus and minus 16.4 by going over through diode uh, voltage drops. So it all makes sense. Now, what, what, what is this guy doing here? Well, if you look at where this is, uh, what is happening over here is that the output of the plus 15 is taken back over the Zener diode, one of the other elements that heats up, and that feeds the input to IC U1 and U2. And IC U1 is a resettable a delay startup voltage regulator at 5 volts and it makes sense because if I take the output of that you can see that there is a 5 volt output right over here and it goes through some filtering so this 5 volt output most likely feeds obviously all the logic and stuff so this guy is um, most likely not working since these guys are running at uh, 200 degrees 300 degrees celsius or so so it makes sense why these two are heating up in conjunction because whatever current is taken in into U1 has to come over VR6 so my guess is that U1 has failed or the 5 volt supply that's being taken out of U1 is now just driving it like crazy taking so much current out of it 
a little bit surprising because I have to look at the data sheet of U1, but typically these things have short circuit protection. So if the output is shorted, it should shut down. But I'll take a look. Maybe it doesn't have that or maybe it's damaged. But if the input to U1 is somehow not working, then all the crazy amount of current is going to flow over. A VR6 is going to heat it up like crazy. And where is that current going to come from? Well, that current has no other place to come from but to come from fuse F1. So it also makes sense. So this whole signal path, no pun intended, explains the temperature that we see. So these three components are suspect. Uh, the fuse is most likely okay, uh, but one of these two, well, even if I find out that the problem with U1 and we fix it and it goes away, there's no way we should leave that, even if it's still working. Uh, extremely unlikely because that means it's, I mean, it's been burning up at 300 degrees Celsius. And we, you might also wonder what U2 is, which is also fed from the output of this um, Zeno diode. U2 is an uh, LT1021, which is a precision reference. Uh, uh, from uh, linear technology and if you follow that you can see that it goes to the ADC reference. So that makes sense. Also the reference to the ADC which is responsible for setting the voltages and getting the feedback and making sure everything is good is coming from this reference. That reference is over there. I hope this is not damaged. But anyhow that's also on the board. So these are three components. Well what do we do as a first thing? Well the very first thing I should do I think is to remove U1 from the circuit. If I remove it completely then this portion of the circuit becomes open and then I'm going to also remove VR6. We can measure it to see if it's still alive and then replace it with a, an appropriate Zener diode again. Then we can measure these voltages. If all the voltages are still okay, then we know that at least this part of the circuit is working. And then we can either replace this or my first thought is to put a 5 volt vo uh, voltage manually on the power supply from an external power supply in conjunction with everything else being powered on and see if the supply comes back to life. And that's going to be a, a huge step forward. So that's kind of my plan. Just give you uh, an idea of what my thought process is when I'm dealing with a problem like this. So let's go ahead and do one by one. Remove U1, remove VR6 and see what is going on. So I'm here trying to remove this board in order to go ahead and unsolder these components and figure it out. So everything is obviously on connectors. You can see the fan, uh, the connection to the bottom board, the digital connection, the, the display connector, they're all over here. Everything is disconnected, some of the transformers. But then they have two wires that are soldered to the board. I, why? I mean, if, you, if you're going to put connectors on everything, then why would you all of a sudden solder two wires to the board? I cannot understand why they've done that. Either they have, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I venture to almost say that this connector was supposed to extend all the way over here, but they, maybe they ran out of that connector. I have no idea. Here, take a look. You see, these two wires are soldered in, so I, I can't remove them. And they're actually not very well soldered neither because there uh, seems to be not enough solder on there. So I cannot remove this last connector and remove the board without cutting or unsoldering these. So all the effort of having everything else as a connector kind of defeats the purpose if you're going to do that. Uh, so now I have to go and either cut it or maybe put my own connector in its place so that it can be connected and disconnected easily. Ah, oh, crazy. Here we go. So I decided not to cut that out. Uh, I just worked on this board as it was uh, in the chassis and I decided not to do that. It's okay. It's not a big deal. But here we go. Then uh, if you look closely, I've gone ahead and uh, removed there we go, should give you a quick view here. I have gone ahead and removed uh, the, the voltage regulator that was there. And I still, I don't remember where I put it. Uh, let me just see if I can grab it to show you. And uh, also at the same time, uh, I removed the Zener diode. Here we go, I grabbed them, sorry for the delay. There it is, uh, so you can see it. Uh, this was um, an LM2925T, uh, which is a five volt regulator plus the, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the delay and startup and all that. And here's the, Zener diode, I measured the Zener diode and it's a short basically, it's got 40.04 uh, volt on it uh, in both directions, so it's definitely dead. And I'm sure that this is also definitely dead. So we're going to get rid of this. This is actually a, an obsolete part, but I did find some replacement on eBay and I ordered a couple of them. They were very cheap, you know, just a few dollars. And since they're, they're definitely dead, now you can see that the pad left over and despite the high temperature this has been running, all the pads survived, a good quality PCB. And here is where the Zeno diode used to sit. I have also removed that as well. Now before I go ahead and replace anything, although I don't have the voltage regulator, but I do have the Zener diode replacement. Uh, you, I bought a whole bunch of Zener diodes before when I was reviewing the source meters. And uh, this is a 2.4 volt one. The, the Zener diode that used to be there was 2.37. And I think it should be okay, at least for our test. Uh, I can always order an exact model later. So we can try and put that in. But before that, 
I wanted to take a look and see what we're supposed to actually expect to see. So uh, I removed uh, this component and that component and I, we should be able to measure 15 volts perfectly here. So we should be able to measure the 15 volts at the input of the regulator and also have the Zener diode. Uh, well, the input will be open in this case because there is no... Um, the zener diode is missing so I, well, I shouldn't say it's open because there's two resistors here that are 215 ohms so if there is no load if there's no current being drawn we should still see the 15 volts sitting at the input of the regulator even even though there is nothing there's no zener diode so that should be still uh, possible to measure so let's just go ahead and give it a, a quick measurement should be fairly easy to try it out and what I've done is also I have put <laughs> put the the fluke uh, multimeter directly inside it is, it's completely insulated of course it doesn't doesn't matter but uh, it's sitting right on the the heat sink over there so here we go I can uh, I'm not I'm just gonna film the meter so you can see and I'll, I'll turn it on first there we go it does exactly the same thing the screen comes on briefly and then makes the same noise so nothing actually has has happened so I'm gonna measure uh, across the terminal one and uh, uh, three of the regulator which would be where we would normally expect the 15 volts so let's go ahead and and measure that here's terminal one and here's terminal three and there we go perfect 14.976 it should be 15 volts and that's exactly what it is and since I already have the ground connection I should also be able to measure the 16.4 volt which should be somewhere around there let me see if I can find it and there it is there it is here's our 16 point uh, 4 volt uh, supplies is a little bit higher than 16.4 so it all makes sense so at at least as far as the voltages are concerned everything is is, is working so the other regulators that are supposed to give us plus 15 volts is working without any issues and while I'm at it I can also measure the negative uh, 16 volt supply I, while I have it and here it that should be right over here there it is the negative supply so the positive and negative supply are both functional which is great which means that uh, that part of the circuit at least doesn't seem to have any problems. This uh, is, a, is a good starting point right now for us. So two things I'm going to do. Install the Zener diode, install some cables on these pins where the 5 volt would normally go so we can inject our own 5 volt into it and see if the supply comes back to life. And once I install this, we will close that path and we will start powering the reference which is right there, the, uh, the linear technology reference which is sitting right there. So that's going to get powered on as well. So we will see and uh, we can measure the reference voltage. So a little bit more soldering and I'll be back. Alright, here's our uh, Zener diode installed and two cables right here in the corner of the frame uh, where I am going to uh, inject my own 5 volts into the system to overwrite the fact that the regular is obviously missing. So with the included Zener diode I can go ahead and power this on and make sure that things don't go up in flame again. There we go, turning it on and I'm gonna bravely touch it by my finger. Ah, perfect! Room temperature and the fuse also at room temperature, just a little bit warmer. Perfect! It's good. So now the only other thing I want to measure before we inject our own uh, 5 volt into it is to make sure that our LT linear technology ADC reference is producing 5 volts because this was also in this path, this path from hell from these two components. So uh, let's go ahead and measure that. That's very easy to measure for me. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna move the camera. I'm just gonna show you the result of that. Let's see. I'm gonna look at the ground here and the output is here. There you go, look at that, perfect, 5.0033, beautiful, so our 5 volt reference for our regulator is in fact, uh, for our ADC reference is in fact working, so the only thing that's outside of the uh, system right now is basically uh, the fact that the regulator is missing, so that should be pretty easy, and I'm going to go ahead and use one of my old power supplies, this one that I fixed in one of my other videos to provide this one with the 5 volt to see if it comes alive, so it's like two repairs in one. It's like power supply inception uh, using one of the ones that I fixed before to power this one. So let me uh, connect it up and slowly we'll raise the voltage and see how much current the, the 5 volt will draw. All right, I'm going to power the main power supply on. There it is. It's going to give me the error beep. There it is. And that's the same thing as before. I'm going to increase this by 0.1 at a time and see what happens. I've already connected it. Let me just show you just to make sure we follow. 
what we're doing here, there it is, I've connected it to where the regular would be, they look very close but they're actually quite stable so they're not going to touch each other. And uh, I'm putting the positive into the positive and the ground of course into ground and we can go ahead and slowly raise the voltage. Here we go, that's 0.3456, nothing so far and oh it's coming up there's 2.5 volts not too bad so far oh oh look at that I just heard something let me just go all the way to 5 volts we have, we have a display this is like a miracle of science again look at it it's beautiful let me enable and disable oh it looks good the voltage is a little bit wacky let's see Oh no, the knob is broken. That's terrible. It's clicking, but it doesn't. Oh look, no matter which direction I go. You know, this is actually a really common problem with these power supplies. I've had that many, many times. And uh, they, they they just always do this. It's really annoying. I have to open it and fix it. There's actually a way to fix it. Uh, and then if I go to 25 volts. Oh, there's one volt. There's two volts. Okay, let me just at least get these things to show something so we can put it on the multimeter and see if there's anything uh, come on stay okay there it is so minus 25 is at 2.96 plus 25 is at 2.03 and plus 6 is at let me see if I can get at least a few volts out of it with the broken knob come on give me anything ah one volt okay at least it's there okay now we can measure these three voltages see if these are alive or not at least all right, let's try it. Sorry that I'm doing this uh, by holding it in my hand. Just wanted to get a quick measurement. So this is. Uh, let's see what do we have. There you go. Look at that. 0 0.997 versus 0 0.998 is pretty close. Let's try the plus and minus 25. So what was plus 25? Plus 25 was supposed to be 2.03. 2.03. Ah, oh, this is beautiful. Minus 25 supposed to be minus 2.96 and minus 2.96 fantastic so the only problem we seem to have is the fact that we don't now have this regulator in there and I can't just put the regular regular regulator in there because it needs to have those options in there and uh, there it is so it's drawing uh, not so much only about 70 or 80 milliamps uh, from the fiber supply so indeed that regular was giving all this trouble and uh, everything is working well so the only other thing I have to do is wait for the uh, regular to arrive from eBay and put it in and and I also want to show you the block diagram of the voltage regular so we can you know learn something new about the component we just replaced and that should be it so what is so special about this regulator anyway well it it provides uh, the ability to reset the regulator as well as a delay function for its recovery time if something goes wrong or just when it powers on so something like this is useful if you want to turn off the regular output power whenever uh, there is a short circuit or whenever there is an under voltage condition or if the voltage regulation isn't actually uh, happening if it's not reaching the regulated voltage you can automatically turn it off or at, at power on you can have a delay uh, um, um, uh, for some time before the output actually reaches the regular output this is useful when you want to have a power sequencing in some applications so in this case they have some reasons I'm sure uh, that they require the digital power supply to come on a little bit later after everything else probably to make sure everything has settled down so when the digital stuff boots up everything is already settled and all the capacitors are charged and all the uh, filtering is happening and so on and on and in the data sheet there is an interesting curve that I wanted to show you here it shows for example various conditions where the the reset can come into play and, and uh, have an effect. So for example here during power on the output is regulated to 5 volts and there's a huge spike for example at the input voltage that goes up to 60 volts and as soon as that happens the circuit detects that the reset goes down the regulated output turns off to protect the circuit and it goes back on and begins regulating again. Here's a condition where the voltage goes so low where regulation is not possible and you can see that the reset goes back down again to bring the voltage down to below that voltage again. And then uh, if there is some noise uh, on, on the input voltage it can handle that and nothing happens. Here's a short circuit condition as soon as the uh, short circuit is detected the output goes again the reset goes down and it goes back on once it's recovered and then of course at the end is a turn off region. So here's an interesting example in the case of a uh, load dump, a low input voltage some noise, a short circuit, the thermal shutdown, here's an example of a thermal shutdown, it heats up so much that it you know, automatically shuts down because of temperature effect and, and then it, uh, the reset goes down. So it's just a basic example 
of how the reset and the delay function can be implemented. Another interesting thing is that uh, there's actually the full, oh, the full schematic of it over here. Now I'm not going to go into the detail of the schematic, but it, it, you can get an idea about uh, what is going on in it. Uh, for example, here's the uh, delay line capacitor. So there is a constant current going in here, and this constant current will uh, charge and discharge a certain capacitor. So this, in this case, the current will come down and will discharge the capacitor. And once the capacitor discharge is completed, then this node voltage will reach a certain amount, and then that will only then trigger the output regulation to happen. So here's the reset line. Here's the input voltage to the regulator, here's the output voltage to the regulator, and this is the output transistor. This is the voltage divider that monitors the output voltage fed back to this differential amplifier, which then goes into negative feedback and then adjusts the output transistor to keep the voltage regulated. The reset line, which is controlling this pin here, by bringing the reset line, all the current will flow through the reset, turning off this section of the circuit, putting this voltage back up high, turning this transistor off, and the output will then be pulled down to ground. There'll be nothing there. So this uh, delay and the reset work in conjunction by enabling and disabling uh, this output here by through this different by disabling the differential pair and pulling the voltage up. So you can see, get an idea of how this happens. And this constant current going through this current source here is what enables the delay function to be implemented with only using a single external capacitor. By choosing the value of the capacitor, you can choose how long the delay is before the output regulation begins. And since this current is small, you can achieve very, very long delays, several seconds, 30 seconds, as much as you want, um, by having the leakage current go through uh, in the capacitor, discharging it, and eventually enabling the chip. So I'll just give you a quick idea of what it is that we're replacing. Uh, this component here, again, I still don't have it. I'm waiting for it to arrive. But uh, I forgot that actually the knob was broken, so I have to take that apart, clean the knob, make sure it goes back to normal, and we can try adjusting it. And I've gotten the replacement parts now. They just arrived uh, from eBay, and there was uh, four in a pack. So that's going to give you a, a good, easy opportunity. You can see this is an identical part to what I removed from the instrument before. Should be pretty easy to put one back together. I'm just going to go ahead and solder it back on the unit. Nothing fancy, just soldering one of these guys back, just cleaning the pads and heating it up, making sure that the, the body of the regular that makes good contact with the heat sink that's embedded in the PCB itself, because they're using the PCB as the heat sink in this case. So let's go ahead and do that, plug it back in, and see what happens. And here we go. You can see, assembled back in place. It was pretty straightforward and quick, so I didn't really cover that part, but you can see that I've soldered it back onto the, the PCB, which this, this portion here, of course, act, acts as a heat sink. Although we know what how much power consumption is going through this chip, I think it was 80 milliamp going through 5 volts, and the, what was feeding it was about 15. So you have 10 times you know, 0 0.08, so it's about 0.8 watts or so. Let's say 1 watt at most. But either way, uh, I'm going to check it with my finger. Hopefully it won't burn me this time. And I will find out if it's working um, well and it's uh, at least uh, reasonably thermally connected to the chassis. All right, let's go. All right, all uh, put back together. Knob is cleaned here and let's see what happens. Here we go. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Perfect. Turn it on. I can control the voltage. No problem. 25. You can see 25 volts, minus 25, and it yeah, seems pretty good. The only other thing I want to do is just to quickly verify uh, how good the output voltage is versus what is displayed because these power supplies uh, measure uh, what is uh, being actually measured at the output terminal and not what is being set because if I go on display limit you can see that it is set to zero volts but if I turn that off you can see it's measuring minus nine uh, millivolt but that's okay you can get rid of that with calibration the calibration procedure is very very straightforward uh, but I want to just measure the accuracy of what is being displayed because that's what matters the calibration can correct the difference between the limit and the displayed limit but if this value is being displayed incorrectly then there's something wrong with the ADC sampling and I'm interested in measuring it especially because uh, part of the circuit that provided the ADC reference was uh, one of the sections where the uh, regulator was damaged. So let's give it a try and see what happens. And here we go. Let's do some measurements. And look at that. This thing says 0 0.009 negative, and this is, says minus 0 0.084. So it's dead on, as accurate as you would uh, <laughs> ever want it to be. And now let's go to plus 25 volts. Right now it's set to 25.03. So we can go ahead and switch it over and see what it says. 
There we go. And check it out. 25.04 versus 25.03. And so 3.9. So it is very, very, very close to what it's supposed to be. And if I go to minus 25, let's set that to some random number. Let's say minus 20.97. Plug it in here. Minus 20.97. It's, it's very, very good. Uh, considering that it was damaged and all the thing is going through and all the age that it has and all that. It is very impressive. Um, let's go back to the 6 volt input again. Here and let's go to 1 volt. You can see it says 0 0.992. 0 0.992. Perfect. Let's go all the way to the top. 5.991. 5.993 is pretty good. It just needs a, a minor calibration to bring it up to spec completely. But other than that, it's, it's seems to be working uh, working really really well. I can put it on the uh, uh, 10 amp fuse, and it's gonna complain. That's fine. There we go. It says 4.9922 amps. 4.991 amp. Perfect. Just one last measurement for the sake of fun. There we go. Just shorting it out. 1.0035, 1.003, perfect, it's beautiful, it's back to life, another instrument saved from the landfill, it's always a great thing, so if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, I always really appreciate it, I know that the repair videos are one of your favorites, so I've gone and bought a bunch of things for you uh, to repair for you guys, I have a few other uh, repairs that I have to do, I'm a little bit behind schedule, and those repairs are going to be pretty, pretty cool, uh, some really neat instruments. So yeah, let me know what you think, give it a thumbs up, it always helps, allows YouTube to advertise the video and of course it will reach more audience and I always appreciate your comments, it's always fun to read. So until next time.